I'm delighted you're all here, truly. Thank you for coming. And thank you for this opportunity to tell you what the heck we're doing. Um, I am a clinical nurse, just like you guys, and have done many, many things in my career. By this time, I've been an RN for 114 years, actually uh, 53 years. I went to school early, like I was 11. Um, anyway, I'm easily bored. And like many of you in here, probably have done many, many different things just to keep it interesting. Um, back in 2002, I was working PDICU and I quit because I thought my license was at risk, staffing was not good. And um, so I quit, but then I had to figure out what to do next. And um, I spent a couple of months reading all the studies. Everybody knew things were going to hell in a handbasket, right? Um, and I wanted to know where the holes were, why they were there and how long they'd been there. So after that time of research, I was appalled. Things were way worse than I thought they were. And I thought, you know what? People need me. People need an experienced clinical nurse who knows the language, who can talk to docs, work with people in the community setting as well as in the hospitals and teach them, empower them with information, guide them through the system so they don't fall through the 900 cracks and advocate on their behalf. And I thought, whoa, that's a really good idea. And there must be somebody who's done it. I know nurses across the country have thought of this many times yourselves. And I thought, well, somebody's figured this out. They can teach me how, and then that's what I'll do. Well, I looked all over the place and there was nobody doing it. And being the risk taker that I am, I said, I'm gonna do it. So I went out in the community and I just started talking. There is nothing shy about me. I will go anywhere and talk about this and talk about health literacy. And patients just started coming. Of course, I didn't know what to do, really. I mean, I knew what had to be done, but I didn't have a process. So every patient taught me something. Docs taught me, hospitals taught me. Um, and I worked solo for seven years with patients um, virtually across the country, as well as locally here in Arizona. and. Over seven years, the RN patient advocacy process, the basis of our practice, emerged. You can't just sit in a room, as I've said to many, and make this stuff up. It, it has to be based on actual practice. Now, I'm willing to bet that everyone in this call is a patient advocate, right? Well, of course, I can't hear you. Yes. Or See most of you, but I'm willing to bet you're all patient advocates and you have all thought about doing more with patient advocacy than you've been able to. In the hospital, it's pretty difficult um, because of time constraints, staffing constraints. And so the beauty for me about being an RN patient advocate is I get to do what I know is right for my patients. I get to spend time and I'm well paid for doing so. I get to teach. I get to make certain they're seeing the right docs and I coordinate all of the uh, care from the different providers. Um, it's very, very satisfying. Uh, in fact, it's the coolest thing I've ever done. In 53 years, it's the coolest thing. And I welcome the opportunity to speak with others. Now, one of the most important things that you need to understand about the RN patient advocacy world is when you do this, you don't finish the class and then go home and have a happy time. You become a member of a community of like-minded nurses across the country. We're in about 28 states now, right? So you become a member of the community. One of the reasons that we are the number one patient advocacy teaching program for nurses is because we include advanced science. 
Now, some of you know what I'm talking about, some of you don't. Um, what I'm talking about is the inclusion of traditional Western medicine, yeah, which we all know we've been doing it all our lives, uh, lots of drugs, and it includes systems biology. Systems biology, I'll talk about that in a minute. It includes functional medicine, which is fascinating because these are MDs and DOs who go back to school to learn this way to do medicine. And they go after something called root cause. Like, let's say you get a, pardon me, a diagnosis of cancer. Rather than immediately going, well, we're gonna do this chemo, we're gonna do this surgery, this radiotherapy, whatever. The first question should be, uh, why do you have cancer? Because if you understand why something is happening, guess what you get to do? I've seen stage fours reversed. I mean, it's possible, it's not magic, it's learning how to use science to do this. Anyway, so functional medicine, and if you wanna learn more about this, you might wanna write this down. IFM, Institute, Institute, is that a goat? <laughs> Institute of Functional Medicine. And at the top menu bar, it says, what is functional medicine? And I, I hasten to add that you will probably be very surprised. It makes great sense. Anyway, and then there's integrative medicine. Most of you are familiar with a lot of the modalities. Integrative being the confluence or, or synergism between traditional Western medicine and other modalities, Reiki, uh, myofascial release, acupuncture, art therapy, whatever. Um, and then there is the magic part. Write this down. Systems biology. Now, systems biology began in the last couple of decades in the last century, but it got a huge boost with the Human Genome Project, which took place at the turn of the century. Systems biology, and there are three institutes. The first one, Lo siento. Anyway, <clears throat> the first institute of systems biology was uh, in Belgium, and now there are two more in the United States. Systems biology is the study of how everything in our bodies is from the gene level out connected. Amazing. <laughs> so let's, let's take an example. Um, let's say somebody's got an inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah. Um, what other systems might possibly be impacted by that? I'm asking you. <laughs> Come on. What else would be impacted if you've got an inflammatory bowel issue going on? Nutrition. Nutrition, nutrient uptake, absolutely. Family history. Oh, look who's here. <laughs> hey, Brad. Family history. Um, how about your immune system? Mm -hmm. Yes. Most of your immune system is located in your small intestine. So if you've got an inflammatory bowel going on, you're going to have trouble with your immune system. How about, let's see, where is most of the serotonin in your body produced? Like 95% of it. Your gut. Pardon? Your gut. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and so it's going to affect your brain, your small intestine is actually called your second brain, all right? So we've got nutrition, we've got immune system, we've got brain. How about the human microbiome, the gut biome? Are you all familiar with that? If not, going through this program, you're gonna be real familiar. So here's a question for you at your next party. 
ask this, how much genetic material, now I know we just talked about this yesterday, um, how much, gen you can't answer. Okay. <laughs> how much genetic material sitting in your chair today is human? Go ahead, take a guess. Forty-eight percent. Forty-eight percent. All right. Anybody else want to take a fly and leap? I used to think it was a hundred percent, didn't you? <laughs> he was like, yes. oh, human. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here you go. Remember this for your parties. Ten percent. <laughs> Ten percent is human. Now, what's the rest? Well, it's bacteria. Mm -hmm. Fungi, viruses, protozoa, yeah? And how did this happen? Oh, for heaven's sakes, how did this happen? Well, when we're still in the ocean and haven't progressed very much, but we were beginning to evolve as a life form. We evolved in concert with bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and fungi. And without the population of that which has evolved with us, we would not be alive. So there are several microbiomes in your body. The biggest is in your gut. The, and there is a, an oral microbiome. There's a skin microbiome. There's a vaginal microbiome. But the biggest is in your gut. So let's say that you've got an inflammatory bowel disease and you're not absorbing nutrients properly and you have upset the human microbiome, that allows toxic bacteria to flourish, right? All different kinds. And so when that happens, they are metabolically producing toxins. And where do those toxins have to go? You live up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so it's going to impact your liver as well. So that's just a tiny little example. As an RN patient advocate, all of us learn how to understand root cause because we are able to make the connections. We have a worksheet that does this, we have a process that supports it. Um, if you understand, really how everything in your client's body is connected and what is impacting what else, what do you think you can do with that? Heal. Help yeah. teach, teach the patients. Yeah, you're going to understand what is actually happening. You're gonna ask questions that no one else has asked, right? Uh, and you're going to be able to teach that patient so they understand, oh, my belly hurts. Oh, is that why I'm depressed? Right. Um, anyway, that's just a little example of uh, systems biology. This program, the reason I think it's so important, certainly is this important to me. We are currently living in a country which has the worst health care and most expensive health care in the industrialized world. You know, the Harvard Social Progress Index places us at number 37 or 38 um, in terms of health care quality. And of course, we spend more than anyone. So what's happening? Well, in 2015, the National Academy of Medicine published a study that demonstrated that there are 12 million misdiagnoses in this country every year. That costs $750 billion. Now, you want to save money? How about we stop doing misdiagnoses? And then before COVID, Johns Hopkins was able to prove that medical errors were the third leading cause of death. Somebody's got to do something. Go ahead, tell me who's going to do something. Are we waiting? We are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I cannot think of any, honest to God, I cannot think of anybody better than us 
experienced clinical RNs armed with advanced science and a proven process to begin to make a change. I don't see government doing it. I don't see the health insurance industry, big pharma is not gonna be a big fan. Um, I think it's up to us, experienced clinical RNs, working collaboratively. Now, another thing that's really cool about this program is, and you will see when, when some of the other RNPAs on this program start to talk, once you become an RN patient advocate, you can develop a practice that reflects your own passion, your own community. Many of us start out as generalist. We take anything that comes in the door, but there are our patient advocates who are doing way different things. So this is your opportunity to develop a career that is totally reflective of your professional skills and what you would like to have happen. I could go on. <laughs> but I, I, could, I could go on, actually. Okay, you go on. Let me hold on. Let me, <laughs> let me introduce this fellow. This is Brad Schwartz, who is an angel. Now, Brad was nearly killed by misdiagnoses in the ER. Brad is an attorney and was working both um, for the defense and prosecution on medical malpractice. And then he had a bad headache one day and went to the ER. I hope you don't mind my telling your story. Go ahead, you're doing um, a great job. And um, they misdiagnosed him. He ended up losing part of all four limbs. He became septic, they didn't notice. And uh, so there's an extreme example now. Brad, rather than take the money and go to Costa Rica and live a happy little life, decided to do something else. And he started something called Greater National Advocates, which oh, is- Oh, that's you. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is a gathering place for our patient advocates of every form. Brad is a very big, well, I'll let you, you tell us what you think about our patient advocate. Well, I, I'm going to tell you that if, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. I mean, first of all, this was not like, you know, rehearsed or anything. I mean, I got an email about an hour ago and said, damn, what am I missing? <laughs> I uh, decided to check it out. So it, apparently this is a gathering of potential RNPAs, is that correct? Or, all right, so from my perspective, and, and I've said this publicly, and I've said it privately to Karen, I believe that RNPAs are the pinnacle of patient advocacy in the future of healthcare, because by definition, they have a clinical background, they've decided to make a change and the most important, and anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. Anybody can say, oh, you know what? I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go uh, start representing uh, patients and families. But from what I know is that if you are a clinical individual and you take that extra step and search out and find a program like the RNPA program, in my mind, it's the gold standard. And I'm president of a national organization with the sole mission of promoting the profession and making it known to the population. And I can't be more clear when I say that it's my mission to do everything in my power to make sure that RNPAs are known, understood, and that that credential, that stamp of approval, in my mind, is the pinnacle of independent patient advocacy. Um, and I think that anybody who is here is here for a reason, that they understand the significance of this niche and the importance of this niche. And I just want everybody here to know that I, I recognize it myself. And I, I'm no nurse, but
but I get it. And uh, I've said my piece, but that's how, that's how, that's how I feel. Thank you, Brad. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for what you do and what you started, Brad. Awesome. One other thing I wanted to talk about is a little bit of history. Um, as I said, seven years, 2002 to 2009, I did solo practice developing the process and the tools to go to the process. The process, by the way, is a matrix model and it varies quite a different, quite a ways from the nursing practice, which is a nursing process, which is linear. Um, so the first class, which was only four days long, <laughs> we've come a ways, we've come a ways. Anyway, the first class uh, I taught in September of 09 in Orlando. And then I'm back home in Tucson and I'm talking to the Dean at the College of Nursing at the University of Arizona. And he said, Karen, you need to come, will you guys come in here and tell us what you're doing? Sure. Um, so there I am in the inner sanctum with top faculty, the dean, and a room full of PhDs and me. And as I said, I'm not shy. I gave him two and a half hours, man. I told him everything, chapter and verse. And the, at the end of that, the dean said, well, this sounds like the beginning of a new practice model. Yes, that's exactly what it is. And then came the magic moment. She said, would you partner with us? Thus began 10 years of intensive mentoring of Karen. <laughs> um, I met with my personal mentor, uh, one of the faculty there weekly. And I met with the Dean every three to four weeks for 10 years. This is program development, curriculum development. It was truly a gift, a gift from heaven. Um, we are still closely re, uh, collaborative with the College of Nursing. In fact, some of their uh, courses are in the learning intensive. Anyway, so we come from an academic background as well as a clinical background. So I don't know whether I've taken up all my time, but I will readily, I want you to hear from some other RMPAs besides me. And then I really, really want to hear your questions. Anyway, so. Um, Karen, do you want to go ahead and, and sort of look at who's here to talk about RMPA and then just call on, on us? Because we're all here to, to share. And so why don't you just be the kind of guide us and, and call on somebody that share their experience. Well, I'll call on you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Hi, everybody. So I'm on Boyd, and I believe Sierra is on here, although I can't see her right now. But she is my business partner, and we live in Portland, Oregon, and together we own Connected Care Patient Advocates. And I was in Karen's class in 2017, and I was the first, she usually runs two classes a year, and that year I was the first class, and then Sierra followed right after me. And we, funny enough, worked together for a long time in the operating room, and so that's where we came from. Our specialty was surgery. And, you know, she, Sierra got curious what I was doing because I was carrying around a big notebook full of reading. And um, I told her that I was in, um, in the RN patient advocate program and she got curious and then, well, the rest is history. But in June, it'll be four years since we launched Connected Care and um, it's grown every year and it gets busier and busier, you know, with two people in the practice, it's um, it really has a it's benefits because we have each other to bounce things off of because we, you know, are always each other's backup. But um, I would say that making the switch from being a clinical nurse for 20 years in the operating room was probably the best decision I ever made. And I can tell you that the clients that I see more, more than, I mean, I know they value my clinical expertise. They, they value that I can teach them how to advocate for themselves. I know they value all those things, but they really value the support that they don't have to do this alone, that there is somebody by their side that can help them navigate this, this craziness, basically. I mean, I'm just going <laughs> to call it like I see it. And in, and in COVID it's, you know, there's, there's 
been so many more challenges. We have gotten so many more calls because people aren't getting, they're not getting access to care like they, they would have otherwise. I mean, I had a client who got diagnosed with a stage four cancer in May and didn't get care until August when they called me because they couldn't get care. So like, it, it's just, it's, I have seen the ad, patient advocacy start to just blow up. Like it is, it, the bubble is about to burst or it's bursting because we get, Sierra and I in the last year and in the last six months in particular have had a call from a patient every single week. And that doesn't mean they always convert, but they definitely, we are definitely seeing an uptick in people recognizing that this role exists recognizing that it's a viable solution to their problems, recognizing the fact that, yeah, they don't want to do it alone. They just don't. It's too hard. Um, and so I um, can't say enough about Karen's program. I can't say enough about Karen. She's been a dear mentor of mine for since that class. Um, and the people that I've met along the way, the other advocates, it's just been, it's been a phenomenal experience. Well, um, in addition then to your practice, would you also tell them oh, what else you're doing? Because as an RMPA, as I mentioned, you're free to develop what appeals to you, utilizing everything you learn in the intensive. So, so I will, I'm going to ask Sierra to fill, her, fill us in on that side, but since she's my partner and then I will give her a chance to speak. Is that okay? Okay, but then Karen needs to talk to Renegade also. Okay, well then Karen will be the renegade. Yeah, perfect. Are you talking about plastics, Antra? No, we're talking about health manager. Oh, health manager. Okay, so health manager. Um, hi, everybody. I, um, yeah, I'm with partners with Antra and it's been so fun. I just, a quick little side note. I have to say, I've been in the OR for 10 years now. I still have a per diem position. Um, and I work, I mean, I recently got off maternity leave, so I wasn't at the hospital much at all. So I'm just picking that back up. And I would work one, maybe two shifts a week at the hospital and the rest I fill with patient advocacy. And I probably work the two combined, probably part-time-ish combined, some weeks more, some weeks less. Um, so that's kind of how I balance the two. Um, and I have to say, moving out of the hospital and kind of, back with the patient and getting to sit side by side with them and be like, quote unquote, on their side instead of like on the other side as the questioner, I get to sit with them. Um, it has been really fulfilling and you see such a different side of the scenario with the patient. Um, you know, you always ask the patient, as the nurse, you always ask the patient, you know, what questions do you have? You do your best to educate them and make sure that they really understand it. And I have just seen over and over and over how little they really understand even though no i don't have any questions yeah i totally understand and then they get home and they're like what just happened i don't know what i said yes to i don't know okay. that i should have asked all these questions so i have really really thoroughly enjoyed getting to sit on the other side and just really support the patients as they walk through some of them are simple things um, and some of them are really big complex yucky diagnoses that they have to walk through um, and then Antra and i have partnered with two other gals who have gone through karen's program as well um, and we have created health manager rn and health manager, yep, go for it, Karen. Um, also, oh, you're muted. Thank you. Um, tell them about business, that it's also business in a box. Yes. Okay. So health manager RN is four of us nurses kind of came up with this, the solution because Karen, Karen, puts you through the schooling, really teaches you how to do it. I loved it. It really broadened my perspective, got me out of the conventional medicine little box and blew that lid off. And I got to see the rest of medicine, um, which I have thoroughly loved. So you get all of this, you get out of the schooling. And then for myself, it's like, now what do I do? I don't really know what I'm doing from here. Like it's a steep learning curve as a nurse who has worked in the hospital. Like I, I know how to do the advocacy part. I know how to educate my patients and I know how to navigate the medical system. But when it comes to the business side of things, that's a whole nother ball game that 
I'll be really honest, Antra and I have both said that has been the steepest straight up learning curve we have had through this whole process. Uh, so the you know, four of us, <laughs> I, the you four know. of us nurses um, kind of came up with this solution to do a business in a box. So we have checklists, we have kind of a, a group um, that meet up and chit chat. So everybody kind of has the support as a new business entrepreneur of um, this is what I'm struggling with. What solutions have you found to just kind of have that conversation support as we go. So we have checklists to help you get totally off the ground and running. Um, we have mentoring that we do with all of them that is business mentoring. Um, and then we have our, our group calls to kind of just help as we grow um, from newbies up to, you know, flying individual RNs. Um, what else do you want to add into there, Antra? Well, I would just say that, you know, it's a, it was a natural, the, the idea came about as a natural solution to Karen's program where you do get a, a quite a bit of business stuff, but to actually put it into practice was the piece that was kind of missing for us. And so when, when these students graduate from her class, if they want to be part of um, Health Manager RN, then that, those are the services that are provided. It's really a support system to get them off the ground because how many of us on this call who graduated from her class, no classmates who just got too overwhelmed by it, right? And didn't start a business. So, so we thought, well, maybe we can. And so we're very much married to our inpatient advocates. It's a partnership between health manager and our inpatient advocates to help support the nurses coming out of her program. I love hearing that. That's great. I was right there too. I was like, okay, well now what do I do? <laughs> so yeah, this well, is let me tell you. I I don't mean to interrupt or, or anything, but you know, just hearing this just reaffirms that. I mean, my whole reason for being involved in this community is to kind of like take away all that bullshit of worrying about how to start your business because mm -hmm. the bottom line is you can take these online courses, you can go to a, you know, a community college, you could. Do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is an LLC is about 60 bucks or whatever in any state. And if, if you want to do it, you can do it. The point is um, you don't need to have a website. You don't need to, if you, I don't know. I don't know how else to say this, Karen, but I think what I'm trying to say is that, um, from a GNA perspective, we're, we're trying to eliminate that and remove that as a barrier for people to get into the business mm -hmm. of, of, of serving people who need, who need us. So. I think, Brad, I think what, why health manager is a good idea is because it's the support system, right? It's right. that it's that overwhelming. It's not so much that we're teaching them business skills, because you're right. You don't need the website. You don't need, you can actually just go and do it because you all know how to advocate. Absolutely. I 100% believe that. It's that what I have found with the, and right now we're kind of in beta testing with um, Karen's last class. And what hopefully, I mean, I won't speak for them, but what I see is that they just really love the support, right? right. Like, I just designed my own web page. Take a look at it. It's great. Like good enough, right? You're ready right. to go. Let's you go. got your web page. Right. You right. got your LLC. You know, those kinds of let's check these must haves off so that you have them and they're in place and then off you go. And right. so to your point, you know, people get really caught up in the business side and oh my gosh, this is so scary. And how am I going to do it at the end of the day? Yeah, it's not that hard. Yeah, if you want to do it, you can do it. It's simple. Yeah. It's a no-brainer. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just got to right. do it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. people yeah. who need help don't care. Right. Yeah. That's don't right. Care. And your your group will that you know I see what you're doing. It keeps people in check with that game that you play with yourself. Like, right. well, exactly. I can't possibly publish my website. It's not perfect yet. Exactly. And like Brad was saying, no one cares. Right. They just want you to help. Nobody ever asked me where I got my degree. Right. what my grade point average was right. yeah they and don't that's, care and that's very true yeah. yeah very true they in fact three of the ones that i'm doing the mentorship with have been like oh i did my own web page and i designed my own logo i want to see it and it's like 
that's awesome. You're good to go. Like, go. Yeah. Like, this is great. Like, right. you, you know, so, yeah. and I think they're always kind of a little surprised, like, really? That's it? <laughs> like, so. Well, I mean, you know, you can't fault anybody for not knowing either because, okay. totally. uh, you know, a lot of people are just used to, you know, signing their employment contract and, you know, getting a paycheck and they don't understand how easy it really is. It's our country, believe it or not, is designed to uh, enhance and encourage people to go into business very quickly and very easily. And it's not difficult to do. So well, gonna... unless you're in California. <laughs> well, even so. No, I'm just um, kidding. Just kidding. Ba Barbara, um, you are doing something a little different. Would you tell everybody, uh, the people, the nurses considering this program, how you took and set up something quite different, which fit you like a glove? Yes, yes. Um, what I did was uh, my company's called Keeping Your Parents Safe. Wait, where is it? Over there. Um, and it's because my when my mom had Alzheimer's, we hired a caregiving agency who put a felon in my mom's home as her caregiver, who financially exploited my stepdad for one and a half million dollars and everything he owned. <laughs> After my mom died, she hung around and after my mom died, she um, tricked my stepdad into marrying her, got her name on the house in the will and took out a life insurance policy on him when he was 86 and she was 35. It was written up in the Detroit news and everything. It was a big, huge mess. Well, there was a lawsuit. It got kooky. We lost. Uh, shouldn't have, but we oh. did. So um, my solution, and if I had won it, would I be doing what I'm doing now? Maybe not. So, I mean, everything happens the way it's supposed to, I believe. So, um, so now I help people with their aging parents as they age and decline. And um, I put in place the safeguards that I learned that it would have been super easy to take care of because as, as all of you advocates know, when somebody's in the middle of something, like when you're really sick, like you have a really bad flu or something and then your fever breaks and you finally feel a little bit better, that's when you realize just how sick you were. And when you're in the middle of something like that, you can't be objective and you can't make really good decisions. So that's what I'm there. You know, all of us are there to add that objectivity and to flatten the learning curve for people because people don't know what to do. They really don't. Um, so uh, I actually, 2020 was my best year ever. And um, I employ the stuff that I learned in Karen's program, especially battling UTIs, which are the killer of older people, especially older women. And I've been able to um, stop it in its tracks. So um, I'm competing with someone. Okay. Um, I've been able to stop the UTIs in their tracks from being recurrent and, and help a lot of people that way. And then just connecting people to the resources that they can use or if they need hospice or home care. And I describe myself as the general contractor of healthcare management. Um, I will tell you that when I first graduated from Karen's for, I think it was 2013, the first thing I did was heal my own son because, and I don't know if I told you this, Karen, but he was, he would have uh, chronic ear infections when he was a baby, morphed into chronic sinus infections. Then he got, um, he got walking pneumonia. And then a couple months later, he got mono. And I was like, what? is going on and I just graduated so I did the whole timeline for him and I found out that he had had probably 20 rounds of antibiotics by the time he was 11 and I know right ah! and this was before this was before I had been aware of a different paradigm that you taught so and I took it to my doctor and I said look at this timeline look at how many antibiotics I killed his gut and he goes, oh, he looked at it like it was real cute and put it away. He goes, no, it's fine. I was like, okay, well, see you later. So um, when, cause when he got mono, I was told, you know, it's heavy chance of recurrence. He's gonna be sick forever. Well, 
I put them on every anti-inflammatory homeopathic, um, uh, omega-3s, probiotics, took them off of dairy and gluten, and he went along with it because he was tired of being sick. So after, I think, two months of that, just two months of that, he was fine. No recurring anything. And this was a kid who was sick every week of his life until he was 11. And then after that, after we did all that, he didn't get some, a sniffle for a year and a half. Nothing. He, he was fine. And now he's, now he's great and managing it himself. So I thank you for that. I don't know if I ever told you that, but that was the first thing I did with it. Thank you. I'm delighted. Did you do craniosacral also? No, but you know, <laughs> maybe now I will. I'll do it myself. You know, <laughs> he's 18, so. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much, Barbara, for being here. Um, Terry. Oh, no, no. She says I have to go. Terry, can oh. you give us a couple of minutes? I talked too long. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Terry? Terry. Oh, she already left. He yes. does a Sorry. client call. That's okay. Oh, no, I just, I just texted him and said, um, just I'll call you in five minutes. So okay. um, we've been really slammed lately. Um, I think last week I brought in six new clients. Today I got calls from three lawyers, as, you know, downtown, one at nine o'clock at night. So I think... I think the bubble is bursting right now. I've felt strongly this last year that COVID is showing everybody in America um, the value of our inpatient advocates. I think I was in Karen's uh, 2010 program. Karen was in my class. Karen, was that 2010 or 11? 11? Okay. 11. Okay, so I started um, my company um, 10 years ago, right after um, we completed um, uh, the program together. And um, yeah, it was a steep learning curve once I hit the road out here. And so I've been doing a lot of um, mentoring. Um, this last year, Karen referred me one of the last classes, uh, ladies to um, mentor. And, um, and so that went really well. And I'm gonna try to expand my, my offerings and my support to people that are, are working um, mostly in the traditional world because I was a career ICU nurse. So we tend to get very medically complex clients, but I take so much of what Karen gave me with us and all of our little old ladies with UTIs that go into sepsis. Uh, get put on probiotics and cranberry juice concentrate capsules right away. And, um, and so lots and lots of good stuff. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. immunity is so important from your gut. So um, we have been busy. I've scaled up. Um, we have 12 employees now. I'm trying to hire two more nurses because everybody's getting kind of maxed out. I'm still taking care of 13 active clients myself because I don't have enough nurses. So um, this will probably be the year that I start hiring um, nurses full-time with benefits um, because it's been hard. I've only hired people. I tried to hire them as um, subcontractors, didn't work. Employees are much more loyal. So right now we have... Um, we have five nurses and by next week, I wanna have seven. And so we're in five counties around Chicago and um, it's, it's been the greatest adventure of my life. I wouldn't go back to ICU for anything in the world. We save so many lives, we save so much money. I give away free advice to people all the time when they don't have money and don't even know the right questions to ask. Um, so, yeah, I love this business. It's awesome. And nobody can advocate for patients like our inpatient advocates. And um, I think we're even better than doctor patient advocates, honestly, because <laughs> we we're so loving and so hands on and so relational. And, um, and so that's what's new for me. I, my second book, my first book, Patient Advocacy Matters, went um, bestseller pretty quickly. And my second book is coming out 
and I'm launching an optional video um, course and mentoring with that. Um, but my book is called, is going to be called Nurse Advocate Entrepreneur. And um, Karen wrote the foreword for my first book and Anne Llewellyn from CMSA and the PAC board it, uh, wrote the, the um, foreword for my second book. Um, Anne Llewellyn and Tricia Torrey and I um, put together the first international conference on patient advocacy. And I don't know if we'll have it this year yet or not, probably we'll skip this year again, um, but I'm just, driven to make my life's mission right now is to make sure that every patient in America has access to a patient advocate close by. And um, so that's why I started a, a nonprofit arm of our company this year too, so that I can help people of low income and uh, do guardianship. So it's been a huge adventure. Um, you know, I, I'm a three-year diploma grad. I know nothing about business except what Karen taught me. And I'm just passionate about listening to leadership podcasts all day, every day. Hey, my latest favorite book and podcast is called Business Made Simple by Donald Miller. You have to subscribe to that podcast, Business Made Simple. You will learn so much. And um, it's just like a mini business course in a box. Um, not, not like Sierra and uh, Antra are doing so personally, but it gives some really, really good information. So, so I highly recommend more and more nurses going into this field all the time. And I'm getting ready to launch a major, major social media campaign to um, attract all the unhappy nurses in America right now. <laughs> wow. So, so anyway, I'll keep on uh, um, shining my light and, and hopefully get more um, attendees for Karen too. And um, love seeing Brad and Antra and Sierra and Karen, all you guys that I haven't seen for so long. And um, I'm sorry, I have to go talk to a client right now. People call me at all times of the night and day because I tell them I'm on call 24 seven. So that's my goal this coming year to hire enough nurses so I don't have to do the, the client work, but it's still such a joy. It's nice meeting you all virtually. Good to see you, Terry. Okay, bye-bye everybody. Thank you, Terry. Okay, God bless Thank you all, you. bye. Now I'd like to introduce you to one of the absolute most creative uh, women I have ever met, uh, Karen DeMarco, who has had quite uh, a history of developing many different things, starting with a generalist practice, as I said. So Karen, tell us about all the things that you have done as an RMPA and how freeing it has been for you. Oh, well, I mean, as you said, my your practice kind of is a uh, reflects who you are as an individual, and I am riddled with ADD. So that's kind of what my practice is looked at. Started actually, I started out interestingly enough in 2002 when Karen started, but that was right before I started having kids because as soon as I became a nurse, I worked in ICU and trauma and did some flight nursing, and I saw. I mean, it just threw my justice scale off because I could always see that people who had a nurse in the family or if the patient was a medical professional, they had shorter length of stay, lower morbidity, mortality, better outcomes. They're just like the whole, they were safer because they knew what to do. And I'm like, everyone should be able to have a nurse in a family. So in 2002, I actually did my first pro bono case. It was just an idea. I wasn't charging. I had a friend who, um, uh, who just had found out he had colon cancer and he had been deathly afraid his whole life of ever getting cancer like and then he got it and he was just like beside himself his wife uh was beside herself she had a little bit of a med she was an emt but didn't know and i'm like i said i'll do you a favor you do me a favor let me come to your so he had it biopsied i went to and i'm telling you the story because before i even went through this program i knew what to do you have everything you need as a nurse to become, but the reason to go through this program is because if I knew then what I know now, his life might have been saved, you know, or he might have had a different outcomes. He certainly would have had more options. So 
I went to the appointment with him. Uh, the oncology surgeon came in and, you know, he's white as a ghost in the corner. He simply told him his biopsy was positive. The surgery will be scheduled for this date. Post-surgery, he will have a course of named the medicine, most likely, you know, uh, most likely you will uh, have a course of the chemotherapy medicine. Disney chemotherapy, even in general, some big fancy long-term. Now, Jerry, this guy was just a lay person. So the neurosurgeon stopped and had said, um, so I'll see you, um, we'll do uh, pre-op. I'll see you during pre-op next week. Da, da, da. Just kind of riddled through it. He's looking at me. I'm just sitting there in the background, just listening. And I'm like, hang on a second. And I said, I'll just say his name was Mike. Do you have any questions? And he's like, looking at me, he's like, I, I, I just want to know if I have cancer. All of that time, he spoke for about five, seven minutes. Nothing got in because he wasn't meeting him where he was at. He was scared to death. So I slowed the, the guy down and I said, can you please say everything you said in English and we'll ask questions. So he repeated it. Um, he asked me, you know, again, what do I do? I'm like, I'm just a friend. This is an idea I have for a business, whatever. He said, can I see you outside? And I'm like, oh geez, you know, cause I'm, I thought I'm gonna get, you know, ripped a new one. He's like, why isn't this already a business? He's like, how many people do I do that to every day? And I, they don't even, I don't even know I'm doing that. And they don't know enough to say anything. They're too afraid to call and ask. Now this was in 2002. Now, now how I started. And so I kept doing patients like that just on a volunteer basis. And just as those patients started wanting to send me, you know, word of mouth starts happening like that. Now I'm able to start hiring, but I didn't know anything about starting a business and I was too afraid and I just started having babies. So I'm like, all right, I'll put this on the shelf. <laughs> Fast forward, I kept it in my mind though. I kept looking it up on the internet, patient advocacy, like Karen saw there wasn't, it was an idea, but there wasn't anything about it. And then I kept seeing this lady on the internet, Karen Mercer in Tucson. I kept seeing the name, you know, like 2005, I saw her, 2007, I saw her. And you'd really look on the internet in those days. Finally, in 2010, I'm ready to go. And I thought I was just going to go through. Now she's got a program. Thank God someone already made all the mistakes, figured it out, developed a process. Now, instead of figuring out myself, I could go to this crazy lady's program. And um, so I had a conversation with her and I, uh, I, got, I, I went to class in 2011 with Terry, as she said. I thought I was going to learn all the business and legal ins and outs because I was so conventional medicine minded. I really, I actually at that point still poo pooed alternative and integrative. You know, I thought that was just like woo woo pie in the sky. Oh, that's nice. You know, I was the kind of asshole part of my language that would say, oh, that cute little shaman. It's too, too bad he's not going to have it. You know, like that kind of like really closed minded. Um, and her program, the b business and legals ins and outs was about five, 10% of it. I, I, I don't know the exact, but it was like going to somewhere thinking the world was flat and somebody shows you a satellite picture <laughs> and you come out going, Oh my God, people don't have to be sick. And now I have the tools. You're never going to remember everything you learned in this course, in this class, but you have the tools to find out and then you get hungry for science. I became, I was always kind of a geek, but once that door was opened of systems biology and functional medicine, like so many doors opened. So, and that's how my practice, I became, uh, I got certified in neurotransmitter testing. Not only did I heal myself, cause that's what a lot of people do. Like Barbara said, she helped healed her. I was riddled with, I had chronic Lyme, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, brain fog so bad I had dementia. 27 year history of eating disorders, depression, suicidal. I was a wreck, but you wouldn't know it looking at me because I was so afraid of what people thought of me. And that in and of itself, worrying so bad about people pleasing, whatever was running my nervous system in the ground and killing my immune system. Cause I'm on red alert all the time. And I couldn't heal from systemic yeast, yeast overgrowth and chronic Lyme disease and all this other stuff. And it was because of that program and the seed that was planted in neurotransmitter testing, I became fascinated with that. It's a long story, but I'll just say I healed like that when I figured out what was wrong. Um, I was sick for a very long time. And then I started helping other people in the same way I helped myself, 
one thing led to another. I remember having a conversation with Karen. I'm like, I've got all these clients and they're calling me at three o'clock in the morning and I had to leave my six-year-old's birthday party to go to the ER. But she's like, you don't have to do that. You can do anything. And, and just like that, as soon as the door was open, I had a client who owned a business. He's like, I want this for my staff. I want this for my family. How come everybody doesn't know this stuff? And then he invited me to come in and do programs in his corporation. And then I just moved into corporate wellness. So he, here I am lecturing in corporate wellness about what I call now the broccoli dialogue, which was all about functional integrative medicine and epigenetics and nutrigenomics on you know how everybody can manage their stress and eat better and detoxify and all that stuff. I call it the broccoli dialogue finally now because I remember during that time and nothing against that stuff. I use all that stuff still today, but there was even a deeper level and that's where my, I would say my practice has specialized in uh, psychoneuroimmunology. And it came from reading a book at stoplights one day. I poured through uh, Anita Morjani's Dying to Be Me. Woman was riddled with cancer, had a radical, uh, had a near-death experience and her cancer went away overnight without intervention. I highly recommend the book. And I'm like, hang on a second. Here I am telling everybody that they have to change their diet, do exercise, meditate, get more rest. This woman stopped doing all that. And her cancer went away because she saw something profound that cancer was the symptom, fear was the disease. And then I started going down a, a rabbit hole of radical remission and what happens and what, why is that the anomaly? And why, since we're all capable of that, why isn't science looking at that? So fast forward 2017, I did a research study uh, with a gentleman in the UK um, and we took 25 people with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, other comorbidities that were related like MS, autoimmune, um, chronic Lyme disease and whatever. And many of them who had been sick for 20, sometimes 40 years, bedridden, homebound, very ill with all other kinds of things. Many of them now are saying <clears throat> they're completely healed after 40 years of conventional medicine and even functional didn't do anything for them because the psycho neuro, how the brain, how the mind profoundly affects the biology and it was white noise. They didn't know how much they were keeping their bodies inflamed with the way they saw the world. So that was just been, and that's kind of my wheelhouse now, online education and, and programs. I still dabble in patient advocacy when I have like a year long client whose issues are this and I know the issues are coming from here. Um, and then just recently, because I'm a total geek, because I'm totally addicted to podcasts and learning new sciences and so is Antra and so is Sierra. Like, I'm like, you know those CEs that you have to renew 30 of them every single two years, well in most states, 30 CEs and I don't know about you, I wait to the last minute and just, you know, do the whole review your insulin needle gauges and you know, that kind of stuff. Like just to check the box and you like plug your nose and do it. And I'm like, I'm listening to eight hours at least of podcasts a week of experts in their field. If I could get CEUs for listening to podcasts, wh why isn't that a thing? I'm doing it anyway. So Antra and I got, um, the, I'm leaving out a lot of the detail and the nuance of the story, but uh, now Antra and I have created um, a company with two other individuals who are helping with the business side of it called Renegade, R-N, R-N-E-G-A-D-E, you know, playing words. Uh, and the tagline is disrupting, what is it? It's, uh, I can't remember the tagline. It's leading the, leading the education rebellion. Yeah, leading the education rebellion. Um, we want it to be fun and like Karen Mercero's program, cutting edge stuff that not only will enhance your practice, but you can take into your life, into your community, and isn't just a box checking thing and is like, we want to create a new addiction to for nurses. And you, get see from it. <laughs> and you get a CE from it. Yeah. And it already has verticals, Brad, like uh, the, the attorney who's helping us with the operating agreement is like, wait a minute, attorneys need this. Right. If I could do it. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, you look, that's part of my mission, but the bottom line is, is when you have thousands and thousands of qualified people all over the country, but you only have hundreds of them that are willing to put themselves out there i know how to sell this to attorneys it's my ultimate goal 
is to, uh, you know, make this available to attorneys, not only be for the educational in the exposure part of it, but because I think it's an advanceable cost or expense that attorneys confront to clients that are involved in, you know, long-term litigation because the reason, and it's a very technical reason, it's, and it's obvious because, you know, in injury cases, the defense is just hoping across the board, whatever state you're in, they're just hoping that the uh, plaintiff dies. And- um, Oh, great. It's true. I mean, the, the case becomes uh, less valuable if there's not a living person who needs lifelong care. So, and I know that and I understand it and I know it, uh, how it relates to advocates getting paid and one of the biggest challenges we face. And I want to introduce this to, uh, to lawyers nationwide. I know I could talk to them, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it unless I get more RNPAs uh, on the site because I know that lawyers demand top tier quality. And again, this is not like a paid sales pitch. I am here loving <laughs> it and enjoying it. But I will say that one day, and I don't know when it's going to be, but everybody that went through Karen's program, one day they're going to look back and say, and not only the people that have been through it, but somebody is going to look back and say, God damn. I wish I went through that program and I wish I had those credentials because in my opinion, they're important and they set the standard for the future of the entire patient advocacy industry. Yeah, and, and the, the tentacles that we're gonna give, uh, I think we wanna give plenty of time for questions, but I just wanted to say, forgive my long-winded take, but the point was no matter what, um, the tentacles of the philosophy and vision of this program, you carry with you no matter what it looks like for you. It can start out as a generalist as I did and as Antra did and Sierra did whatever, but whether you're an author or a speaker or you go into a different, like, like it'll have the, the smell, <laughs> it'll have the nuance right. of this program. And I think this is, and Karen's vision is what, what really has been planting seeds to, to change the whole medical system. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I want everybody, uh, all of the RNs here to learn more about the program. Are you seeing you can do whatever you want? <laughs> it will evolve. Now, Rosie, we haven't heard from Rosie yet. Rosie, are you still here? I'm still here. Oh, Rosie, tell us about your practice. Tell us about you. Okay. Um, my name is Rosie Oldham. And I met Karen and took her program in 2018. Um, but historically, uh, starting businesses was never my problem. <laughs> because when I met Karen, I had already started four businesses and had attempted to retire in 2015, having sold my last business. Um, and the work that I was doing was legal nursing for 28 years. And what that did for me was to look at a lot of charts and understand that basically there were a lot of lives that could have been saved. And if only somebody had intervened, if only somebody had questioned. And so um, when I tried to retire in 2015, <laughs> I decided <laughs> that I had to look at something else because uh, playing golf, I live on a golf course. <laughs> And I have done everything in nursing from floor nursing up to director of nursing, which has served me well because I also did risk management and that helps me know where to go and who to talk to when things get really rough around the edges. And I think nothing of calling up an administrator <laughs> if I have to, if I'm not getting where I need to go with people uh, within the system. And I can only tell you that my very first case was similar to someone, I think it was Barbara talking about her 
mother with Alzheimer's. Um, my father had Lou Gehrig's disease and my very first instance of trying to advocate as an RN daughter, which is a very hard thing to do because when you're in the midst of a disease like Lou Gehrig's, your love for that person as a daughter really sometimes impedes you from having objectivity in some ways. Um, but they overdosed him and we did file a lawsuit uh, when they put in a JPEG, he was still walking and talking. But if you die at age 72 and you're not working or bringing in income as Brad knows, um, the value of your case is about $150,000. So I was so angry that I did the case myself and settled it with the administrators, um, adjust, the adjuster from the insurance company. So a lot of my legal work has been uh, very valuable uh, in starting my IRNPA type of work that I do. Um, so when I go in and look at a patient in a hospital, I look for more than just what I'm seeing in the bed. I'm looking for standards of care. Um, are the doctors acting in a prudent way? And many times my language gets attention of the doctors in ways that are good and not so good. <laughs> and I don't care anymore because I'm older. And the beauty of getting older is it doesn't matter what people think of you. When mm -hmm. I advocate for patients, I'm like a pit bull. You know, and with the COVID, it's been very hard. I've had patients in hospitals and you can't go see them. You can't go talk to the doctors. It's very hard to get the nurses on the phone, as you know. Um, so I've been blasting um, faxes, gone back to faxing into the nurses station to communicate for my patients. Um, I've had so many patients that I have been profoundly honored to serve. And what I mean by that is because of Karen's program, I knew a lot about risk and the management of quality in hospitals. I was a director of nursing. And the bottom line is Karen helped me see beyond what I was looking at prior to her program. There's so much more with the functional medicine. I had never even studied that much less paid attention to it. And without Karen, I don't think I would approach my patients as I do today, which is I start looking right away for the root cause of the problem. I had a patient recently that was a legal patient. Um, and lo and behold, one of the things I love to do is research. I have nurses that actually do it for me now. But Cipro was the drug in question. And does Cipro cause psychosis? Well, this woman had been court ordered through the courts into treatment with a drug for psychosis. And the whole thing started when she had a infection and mm. took Cipro. Well, none of the doctors would listen to her. None of the doctors would listen to her mother and she was court ordered. Actually, the COVID helped us a lot in this regard because um, she finally ended up back in the hospital and I was able to talk to her psycho psychiatrist and send him some research on Cipro causing psychosis. He immediately finally took her off that medication and she returned to a much more normal state. And the other thing Brad brought up about working with uh, attorneys, I have worked on several cases with attorneys the very first one I did on a lien, the attorneys were trying to keep this patient alive. Um, when I walked into that situation, I thought, um, I'm in big trouble because she was one of the sickest patients I've ever seen with multiple, multiple problems. Everything from paraplegia to being an amputee to having lupus to just everything you could imagine. 
And the deal is we did keep her alive for almost 10 months. She passed away about 10 days before her own deposition, which is a very big loss to attorneys because I've worked with attorneys for a long time. Just like Brad described, you're more valuable when you're alive than when you're dead, unfortunately. So that particular case is uh, going forward even after her death. But I will tell you, Karen's uh, resources that I obtain through attending her program have saved many people's lives. Um, when I walked into a patient's room where the husband called me in, she'd been brought in because she had um, collapsed and her potassium was like two. And I asked him about her meds immediately and what we discovered is, and Karen spends a lot of time on PPIs, <laughs> time <laughs> yeah, pump inhibitors. <laughs> and this was after Karen's class. And it alerted me to the fact that when he told me she'd been on Prilosec for 22 years, that was the thing that I jumped on immediately. And mm -hmm. I said to her gastroenterologist, something's really wrong here. <laughs> and he would not believe that that PPI had much to do with anything. So I ran home, we were still in the hospitals then, came home and got all my research, printed it out, ran back to the hospital and gave it to him. And he was open to the fact after reading the research that that was what was causing this near death experience. And I'm telling you that woman was near death. And today she um, is back taking care of her husband who's got Alzheimer's and I still stay in contact with her, but she's so healthy at 84 off that Prilosec. It's the most amazing thing. We got her on <clears throat> all kinds of things to help her gut. So I do also believe the gut is part of the brain. And we actually have a new doctor in Litchfield, Arizona. I haven't met him yet, but he's a neurogast neurogastroenterologist. Wow. Yay. You, you send me this link. Yay. Yeah, I will hey, look Rosie, it up. I Rosie, think everybody's interested in that. Yeah, that's awesome. Rosie, um, so one of the things Antra and I are planning on doing with this podcast, which I, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm taking up time. Would love to have you on because we're going to do like a Friday kind of thing where we have nurses on to tell their horror stories and whatever. Um, those are two that would just be amazing for the public even. And and that's, you know, I'll shut up, but that that's... Uh, I love those. I love hearing those stories. Yeah. And well, I mentor, I try to mentor other nurses. I have several in my practice. In my legal nursing practice, I had as many as 200, over 200 working on a project. And one of the things I did was defend pharmaceutical companies. Oh my God. <laughs> but, that made me so paranoid about drugs over the years that unless they've been on the market 15 years, I won't even touch them half the time. <laughs> so I have a lot of experience with drugs and not that that's my specialty, but it's really a fascinating investigative area for me. Is, is that what you wanted to hear, Karen? Yeah, thank you. And thank now I think we need to open, thank you all RMPAs, truly. And I hope you, everyone else on this call sees the tremendous variety of what you can do as an RNPA. Anyway, the time for questions. Hey, real quick, if you guys want to raise your digital hands, you go to the uh, participants box. Wait, no. Yeah. Yeah, down Ready? at the bottom. Down at the bottom? I think. No, you go to chat, right? Oh, it's not, it doesn't have the raise your hand option. No, well, hold on a second. Oh yeah, up in the pick or up in our corner, it doesn't have it. Under Usually reaction. that's where it is. Yeah. Rosie? You just did yours, how'd you do yours? It's under um, I'd just like to add one more thing. Um, the Arizona Association of Patient Advocates is just now finalizing their 5013C and I serve on the board and our speaker in February is going to be Brad, right here in this room. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so if anybody's interested in, just see me or call me. I think I have my yeah. phone number up there. 
Thank well, you. follow Brad on LinkedIn because I get all yeah. kinds of stuff with the LinkedIn, which is awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, question. Wait, Misty, wait, Misty, how do you raise the hit your hand real quick? Under uh, reactions. Yep, exactly. At the under, bottom. Under reactions. Oh, I see it. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Under reactions, you can raise. Okay. Your hand. Question. We got two questions right now from Marsha and Donna. And Debbie. And Debbie. I the thumbs up. <laughs> oh, gotcha. <laughs> Three participants. Okay. So who wants to wow, we got questions. Yes. Somebody go. Donna. Donna. Hi. My, I have a few questions. One, I um, am a nurse from the OR, so it was nice to see other nurses in the OR. Oh. And um, I started thinking about this because um, almost like Karen's story where uh, my dad was sick and then I was thinking, oh my gosh, thank goodness I know the questions to ask and what do people do that don't have medical background in their family. And everyone, I said, this is my idea, this is my idea, I thought it's a great idea. And so then when I started researching it, I found Karen in this whole program. So I was so excited to know like, I didn't have to start the build the wheel and start from scratch and that there was support out there. Um, but one of my questions is, is I have a license in Ohio and we recently moved to California. So I would be practicing in California. Would I need to get a California license as well? Or would um would my would I be covered under my active Ohio license? Barbara? I think you'd have to get, it's my understanding that any state you go into, like our state doesn't just automatically extend and go, okay, they want their money. So um, it's probably just a matter of paying a fee. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is. And I would say it's worth it to have both licenses. Oh actually. yeah, I would totally do that. You know? Yeah, because it's, it's a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah, I live in California too, and it's, it's easy to get a license yeah. in California. Yeah. It's not long okay. to wait. Mm -hmm. And then Karen, where, when is your next class? And do you have a next class because of COVID? Oh yeah. Um, our next class begins on April 5th, 6th, yep. April 6th. You can apply now if you go to rnpatientadvocates.com. What we ask everyone to do is fill out a questionnaire and then we, you and I will speak because it's an interview. And if it looks like a good fit, you're in. And uh, the it's about seven, seven and a half months of online modules. You will all be working with other nurses. In other words, you're gonna be doing homework in groups of two or three. Um, everybody who makes it into this program has a great deal to offer. And part of that is learning from each other as well as from the instructors. So it's, it's a really interesting program and uh, you become very engaged very quickly. And at the end of the online portion, we have a week long, typically we have a week long um, residential, event, a residential uh, event where everybody in the class comes to usually to Tucson and uh, it's a very intensive part of the program. Um, this last year we, we we, able to we did it virtually. P.S. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> we are going to be doing, I, I normally start in March, but we're going to start in April. So the residential is in November and God willing in the creeks don't rise, we can all get together because it's a, it's a wonderful week. Or and do then, it in Texas. And the, huh? um, and the, or do it in Texas. <laughs> You guys, just okay. so you know that there was a question about, you know, between Karen's class and health manager are in the, in the box, can you, do you have enough information to get your business started? And what I'll say is because health manager is new and we're building it from the ground up, the people that are graduating from this last class that just graduated and this next class are kind of our beta testers. So they get business in a box and that whole thing 
like for pennies for what you get. So it's a really nice addition. It costs a tiny bit more on top of the class, but really not that much at all considering what you get because we want nurses to be part of the the, the marriage of RMPA and health manager and help build us, help build RMPA and RMPAs as a, as a practice and as a um, association. So it's kind of exciting because if you're part of that, you get to be, you get to partake in that and you get to help us build it. So. Well, also if you uh, sign up and are accepted into the program, you automatically become a member in the National Network of Our Patient Advocates, which is an educational uh, and support system. And you would have the ability to access a password protected site, which is a serious library. <laughs> and a place to connect with other RMPAs around the country. And that membership goes through the entire year of the class and for three months afterwards. So yeah. you, you become a part of the community right away. Karen, do you, um, if there's a question on the chat. If one applies to the pro program and gets accepted, do you get the pre-course reading list right away? Yes, you do. So you can start right away. Yeah, it's an extensive reading list. And, it will, and you have to do it, it's required because it'll set you up for, for starting in the program. Does anybody else have that? April's yeah. not that far away. Hyacinth, Hyacinth's hand and then Marsha. Okay, okay Hyacinth yes. first. I have a question, I have two questions actually. Um, the first one is, is the health manager RN, does that come along with the initial um, the initial patient advocate program? It, it doesn't only because it's kind of your option to, to, to be part of it or not. And so you do the class and then some of Karen's students decided not to, which is fine. And they went off and built their business, but some of them did. So it's, it's your, it's your, it's your choice. It's so it's not a requirement. You don't have to do it. Okay. And my second question is kind of loaded um, kind of personal for those who have started their business and went through the program. So it seems like most people who have spoke seem to have a good amount more experience than me. Um, most people would still consider me like a new nurse. Um, I would have been a nurse going on six years now. Um, most of my experience is in um, joint replacement, bariatric nursing, um, antenatal high-risk maternity. Most of it has been in public health. Um, right now I'm doing, um, I work lead nurse for a teen clinic, um, the only teen clinic in North Carolina. Um, and I've known for a very long time that I've wanted to do patient advocacy and um, public health, and especially dealing with my grandmother, um, for most people, you know, when you go into hospital settings with somebody, just noticing that mm -hmm. if they know that you are a nurse, they mm -hmm. pay more attention, mm -hmm. they do a little bit more. Like even to a point now where I try to tell my grandmother, don't tell them I'm a nurse. Like mm -hmm. don't don't even say that I'm a nurse, mm -hmm. but I'll go into the room and they're like, oh, so you are her nurse granddaughter. I'm like, didn't I tell you don't tell them that? <laughs> 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 but, um, and it's just so... I don't want them to know because I want to see what they're going to do if they don't know that there's a health professional in the room. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I've noticed a difference. And that's a difference that I don't like and I don't appreciate. Also, um, working in the community that I work with and noticing um, with the women of color and the death rate um, for... Um, during pregnancy and after pregnancy is something that sure. I'm very, um, it's very dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you guys say for somebody like me who is very passionate about doing something like this, but is so very nervous about starting something like this? Like, I'd like to, can I, yeah, like, I felt the same thing. I felt like, because I, I think I, I worked in the hospital for maybe five years, but in that time, maybe six, 
I did all kinds of things. I did CCU, I did SIC, I did step down, I did nursing education, I did IVs. And I think you answered your own question. I mean, you just listed off this whole slew of stuff that you've done already. So, and you're passionate about it. And, yeah. and, and that's what, that's, what's going to get you there. You know, mm -hmm. you know what, you know, you know what you're doing. And um, the fact that, you know, it was, it was funny when you were talking about, you don't want them to know that you're a nurse. Cause they, <laughs> they say things differently, but that's mm -hmm. where your power is. You know, when I work into a, when I walk into a nursing home, I don't have it with me, but I have a badge, right? It has my name, RN senior advocate. And when I walk in just when that badge and I have my blazer on and everything, everybody just like runs, you know, they're like, huh, ah, you know, they go. And I notice one, one, um, age, she didn't ever, she didn't have her own badge on when she was supposed to. So she left the room. She came back with it on paying attention. I mean, you, that's what you want. That's your power. You know, mm -hmm. they're going to pay attention. So I think you have everything it is, everything that you need. You have the experience, you have the insight, you care, obviously. And, and I think the fact that you're scared and yeah. is humbling yeah. and what you need. It's like yes. if you were offered a computer that had one terabyte of memory, but no access to the internet or a computer with very little memory, but you could plug into the internet. Which would we choose? One You'd want the one that had access to the internet, right? right. You don't need yeah. to know everything. All you need to know is where to find the answers to stay yeah. humble, to look together, yeah. to guide. You yeah. already have everything you need. Just like me in 2002. Right. Sorry, I, I know Karen wants to say something. I got excited about oh, that's your, exactly it. You know, I got excited I, about I, your I, question I, and humility, humility about it, you know? Yeah. I think I also I'd like to say something <laughs> about Karen. What what you Get don't think way, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what you don't think you know, Karen will teach you how to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Because she'll give you the resources so that what you don't know, you'll be very um, self-assured that you'll be able to figure it out very quickly. You'll you'll turn into a dog with a bone, trust me. Right. You will not let it go until you have it. Yeah. Okay? Trust me. <laughs> yeah, you've got it. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, I would like to just add. Go ahead. One, in six years, you've done a hell of a lot. Yeah. That <laughs> tells That's me a cool lot way. about you. And secondly, if you want to work with high risk maternity, you can do that. Yes. Listening to all of these advocates, you see everybody's picked a little bit of a different course. So if that's what you want to do, we'll help you do it. Yeah. And, and thirdly, you're young and we need young nurse advocates because you guys are the future. Yeah. Yep. Like I would say any young nurse. Who, Come on, do it with me. Yeah, you, <laughs> we need you. We totally need you. Do it. Yeah. See, look at Sierra's a shining example. <laughs> I'm getting hit with Nerf guns and I've got this one here. It's just chaos, but you just Aww. do it. <laughs> okay, so next question. Marsha. Is it my turn finally? Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, of course it's your turn. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I just want to say thank you. You guys are wonderful. It's wonderful for me to hear you all so passionate still about everything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 19 years. I've worked in oncology. I've worked in ICU. I currently work in the operating room. And I've always kind of just had that thing like stick up for people. That's always been something that I am, something that I do. And so for me, this idea of doing this uh, is just, I started looking things up and I found you guys. So thank you for that. Um, my question is, more centered around the financial aspect and being able to continue to support myself and my four children for which I am the sole surviving parent. Of. Um, I'm at the top of the pay scale at my hospital, I'm pretty well paid, um, but that's not enough at the point. And for me to make an investment, um, which continuing my education and doing this program would be, uh, I guess I'm just looking for, is it really 
um, as lucrative as I'm hoping that it will be, as well as serving um, my soul. Well, if, you can if, speak if I may reply, um, that's a really good question and a legitimate concern that I think everybody approaching this program has. Um, if you bill, if you charge a hundred dollars an hour, and that's pretty much the bottom, you know, okay. uh, it's yeah, I don't even have that. No, so it's Thank between a hundred and two hundred and fifty dollars dollars an hour. Anyway, if you bill only twenty hours a week, you're going to make almost a hundred. It's more than ninety thousand a year. Yeah. How's that sound? It's less than what I make now. Ah, well then charge more. Um, <laughs> Where do you live? I live in Boston, Massachusetts. Oh, then you can uh, charge more. Um, we have- Well, I don't live in Boston, but I'm like 20 minutes out. Ah, I work okay. in a local community hospital. We have a, um, an RNPA down in the very wealthy retiree community of Miami, who's charging $250 an hour and getting it. Um, okay. We have an RNPA, uh, actually one of the founders of uh, Nurse Health Manager, and she is up in Montana, rural Montana, making $250 an hour. Um, I would recommend for those people like you that you work part-time while you develop your, your business. Right. Uh, some nurses are able to go, boom, right into this full tilt boogie. Not everybody is able to do that. And so working part-time, which will leave you time and energy to begin to develop your practice. You will have plenty of support. I mentor nurses all the time. Uh, and there are other RNPAs who will help you. Anyway, does that, does that help? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, my, my, Marcia, just to give you an idea, my kids were uh, 2011, so they were four, I, I don't do math, but like seven, five, and three or something like that. Um, so I built it working full time at a hospital with three kids, starting one at a time. And then I had it like within six months, I had a wait. Now everybody's looks different, but just to give you an idea, you know, I was a busy mom of three full time ICU yeah. job started slowly. And within six months I had a wait list. And because of that wait list, because I only had limited hours I could spend on the business, but because of the wait list, when the time looked right, because I almost made a medical error in the hospital, because uh, we were so short staffed, I was able to walk in and go, done. Okay. I and I will, and I'll say for our business, because there were two of us, it, it, you know, Sierra, we're three and a half years in, and she's still working one or two days a week at the hospital for supplemental, but we, there's two of us. So if there was right. only one of us, we'd be on a wait list for sure. But also it's, it's been a little bit slower, but we still, but it's gotten better every year. So more, we make more and more money every single year that we've been in business and we've only been doing it for three years. So three and a half years. So for us, it's like, we, we promise ourselves that really five years to get ourselves like billing at 20 plus hours, um, a, a month, if not more. So. No, I think hours was, a week. I mean, yeah, a week. Yeah, yeah. I think you meant a week, but a uh, Rosie, I think it was said something about um, that you guys aren't in the hospitals anymore. That's another question that I have. So it's like an you work, you know, you work with patients where they are. If they're in the hospital, you work with them there. If you if they're out in the community, you work with them there. Mm -hmm. um, when COVID is over, then you'll be in their homes. Um, so another yeah, my thing question that, that I didn't mention is that there is a surefire way to get clients. And that is community health literacy teaching, which will teach you how to do. And there are programs already developed to help you do it. Um, yeah. it if any of you want to see one of these, if you go to YouTube and put in Karen Mercero, that's M-E-R-C-E-R-E-A-U, and sat the word Saddlebrook, all one word with an E on the end of Brooke. Karen Mercer of Saddlebrook. You'll see me do a community health literacy teaching program and how it works and the phone rings automatic. And you can do this virtually during COVID time. Anyway, 
Um, community you health literacy have, is, is a really big, important part of what you do. You already have a lot of contacts at the hospital you work at. So, because found it's a lot about, you know, building those relationships with those people who would refer to you as well. And you have those contacts, so. I think I would like, uh, my question more is like, so there's no like, I mean, my hospital doesn't have a patient advocacy program. There's some in Boston that used to, and I don't know if they still do, or if that's like what you're saying is that it's not in the hospitals anymore. No, it's you, more like an independent, like, you know. You're independent. Hire, People hire you as an advocate yeah. to navigate the medical system as they'd hire an attorney to navigate the legal system. Right. Yeah. Okay. And patient advocates who are hired by hospitals, and there are many, um, basically are Band-Aid people. They are there to support the hospital. Right. They, you know, I mean- I ran into it once with my mother who was sick and had a malpractice suit, but, you know, she was alive and was okay. So, you know, we were told that if she had died, we would have been millionaires you know, uh, they actually said too bad you made it or you'd have a case. So um, I did run into a patient advocate in Boston hospital once, but it was just more like, hi, I'm this, I'm that. And if you have any questions, so, okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. There's still a lot of people on the phone. Um, there are really no other questions. Really? Well, oh, I know. I want to tell you a story. Um, I, I can tell stories till the cows come home, but uh, I currently have a case, a 67 year old gentleman who was diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer in December of 12. And for those of you who may not be familiar, that is the most aggressive form of lung cancer you can have. Typical lifespan is two to two and a half years. We're going on nine years. <laughs> We're going on nine years and it's not magic. You will learn how to do this kind of stuff, all right? Um, and, and as far as being an RNPA and showing up in a hospital and what, in, what influence you have, I got a call one day years ago, um, a young lady had ruptured her appendix and was in the local university hospital waiting for the OR. However, we had big MVA and they said they had filled their ORs. And so she was sitting up there developing peritonitis. All right, so this is what I walk into. The hospital knew me because I had had other clients in there. I show up and I'm very gracious and say, you know, I understand. And what I propose is that I can call TMC, this other hospital, and arrange for ambulance transport. We can have her in the OR right away. Well, oh my God, <laughs> within 20 minutes, she's being prepped, right? When an RNPA walks in and you will learn in this course how to do this, you don't walk in with big boots on, no. big smile, feet don't move. That's what I call it. Yep. Anyway, um, you, you really bring change and it's a beautiful thing to see. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Any other questions? I know I will have questions later, but I just, you know, all this information, I'm digesting it, you know, understanding it. I think I come from a, a little bit different background because I'm currently in the alternative medicine realm. So, but yeah, I can't wait to, to learn everything you guys well, have. Well, you're in the program now, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> hang on. Thank you guys so much for being here, for taking the time. Thank you to the nurses that we asked to share their stories. It's been lovely meeting some of you finally and seeing, um, putting a face to a name. And um, we, Brad, what a pleasure to have you on board. And for all of you interested in patient advocacy, Karen is the go-to. I mean, I, I, a hundred and bazillion percent. She is our, she's the go-to for this. So um, thank you all for your time. We don't want to keep you any longer since we- Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Thank you. You, you can you apply. Go. You can apply at rnpatientadvocates.com. And I'll send you information and we can talk on the phone and I can answer more questions if you like. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.